the old rules, the ones that to one extent or another helped us through four centuries, have essentially been, been overwhelmed by this combination of globalization, this dissemination of power into all these actors, state and, and non-state alike, and the rise of some new powers that aren't totally comfortable with the, with the distribution of, of arrangements in the world and, uh, and the rules such as they are. So when the Russians start talking about not having rules or the end of the old order, I think this is their way of saying we're not comfortable. We think what exists out there is biased against us. It's there to help the United States and its allies. And you know, as the guy said in the movie, we're not going to take it anymore. And that's what I think we're beginning to see. All right. Well, let me stick with the historical backdrop a bit. You have a section devoted to the post-Cold War period. And, you know, talk a little bit about that because you do discuss the progression and also how the world order was defined at that time. And you focus on the issue and the importance of spheres of influence. Isn't that still part of the discourse uh, uh, today? Uh, it is. And you know, after World War II, you had you know, two principal sources uh, of order. One were, were various dimensions of the Cold War, the nuclear dimension, which introduced quite a lot of discipline and restraint into U.S.-Soviet action. So neither would press advantage too far, lest it lead the other to dig in its heels and contemplate the use of nuclear weapons. We also, in a de facto way, as you suggest, accepted one another's spheres of influence. The United States uh, was limited in what it tried to do, say, in Eastern Europe to weaken the Soviet hold over the, its Warsaw Pact neighbors. The Soviets, for their part, were, more, were mostly circumscribed, though not always, in what they tried to do in the Western Hemisphere. And in some ways, the greatest crisis of the Cold War was in 1962, when the Soviets went too far from the perspective of the United States and put missiles into Cuba. And that led, you know, obviously, to the crisis of October. And at the end of the day, the, the Soviets, uh, they, 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 backed, they backed down. So I, I think that tells us something about, uh, you know, one, one source of order of the post-World War II period. There's a whole bunch of institutions, the UN, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. There were the alliance systems that grew up. There was the Marshall Plan that strengthened countries that uh, became allies of the United States and Europe and gave them the capacity to withstand local uh, communist movements. So what you had coming out uh, of World War II were all these Cold War-related arrangements and then all these larger institutional arrangements. So when the Cold War ended in 1989, 1990, we lost those disciplines. And you had the breakup of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the Warsaw Pact, you had, for example, the phenomenon that a former Soviet client state like Iraq would invade Kuwait, something it would not have done without Soviet permission during the Cold War. So you had a, a loosening of the bonds of international relations. You still had in place, though, some of these institutions and some of these rules. But what, uh, what, I, what I argue in the book is that as welcome as things like the UN or the World Bank or the IMF or, or, or other arrangements were, they weren't enough to contain the new sorts of pressures and dynamics that emerged in the world uh, over the last 25 years.